start. Uh, so I think on uh, on uh, the message on Thursday is that we have to start sharp uh, at 4:30. Um, uh, I think because everything has to be really finished by 6:30. So uh, or we can start any time, but we have to finish by 6:30. Um, what I want to do this week is, is really talk about a bit more advanced topics, and one of them is many body and covenant that, that's attracting lots of attention. Um, there's, there's a review article that I wrote uh, a couple of years ago, which actually contains, um, uh, I don't know how many references, but close to 1,000. Even when we finish this, uh, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Don't do a review article, whatever you do. Basically, even after we completed this, I kept getting emails saying you forgot to cite my own paper on this topic and so on. So I think, I don't know, there are 10,000 references probably. I have no idea. It's a huge amount. Um, I'll, I'll try to say a little bit about what the issue, issues are and what, what people found surprising and so on and what's interesting. It really depends where you come from, which direction you come from. Solid state, condensed matter, or if you come from maybe more quantum optic side of things, you will identify different issues as, uh, as, as interesting as it, as, and maybe more problematic or less problematic. The main thing is that, is that somehow it's very difficult to talk about, so this, you know, for a physicist this is an interesting topic because, because we believe that at some stage the world under some circumstances becomes classical, whatever this means. And we've got these many roads to classicality and, and none of these guys actually agree there is no, we don't have a consistent way I would say which, which tells you okay this is, this is how it is and that's the classicality and, and everything else redu reduces itself to this so I think you've heard zillions of these uh, arguments one of them is famous Bohr uh, argument with h bar going to zero um, giving you some kind of classical world um, uh, We've kind of argued against it in a way that I never mentioned H bar in the first uh, uh, three weeks of the course, which tells you that it's nothing to do really with H bar, probably. Um, but then people talk about um, some kind of uh, macroscopic limit where the number of particles goes to infinity. Uh, you've seen this, for example, with coherent states. We say uh, coherent states of, uh, of uh, arbitrary large amplitude are the same as, as classical fields. Um, so basically things that don't commute suddenly start to commute and you can derive a classical algebra out of these things if you like. Um, another limit you may, you may want to explore is something like the temperature. What about high temperature? If, it, if, if the temperature is very high, surely I'm going to have something that's mixed enough that it's um, uh, for all practical purposes classical. Um, um, mass may be another thing. If I have a massive object um, then, then I should also get a classical limit in, in, uh, in many ways. Um, I think, you know, if you take, if you take, if you take very simple formula of, of the Broglie and you say uh, the way that quantum mechanics was derived from massive particles is to say that um, you can associate um, a wavelength with uh, with a particle moving uh, of some mass m moving at some velocity, then you can already see. Uh, that uh, that h bar going to zero means that the wavelength is zero, so that means it's not quantum mechanical. Mass going to infinity also means wavelength goes to zero. So lots of these things are simply derived from 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 very very simple identities of this type. And in some sense, what was surprising about about many body entanglement is that actually none of these statements are really true. In some sense, I can find. Uh, I can find exceptions to all of these guys, and I can find uh, quantum behavior even as I approach arbitrarily high temperatures and I approach arbitrarily high numbers of, uh, of particles, basically arbitrarily massive and so on. So the surprise somehow is that you, there is no classical world, I would say. I don't know how surprising this is after what we've gone through, but, but I think that's, that's the idea, that, that you cannot really, no matter how classical you are, I can always perform some kind of measurements to, to show you that this actually ultimately really is uh, entangled. Um, so how did the game start? The game started really by analyzing, uh, analyzing simple models and saying what happens now? Can we take one of those typical condensed matter 
systems and can we then show that even in the large uh, number of particles limit, for example, I'm still going to get some kind of entanglement even at the finite temperature. And very simple questions like that. Of course, uh, like I said, you know, the usual thing to do is, is to go into something that's exactly solvable because you don't want to be uh, bothered with doing too many simulations and, and things like that where you are uncertain about your, your methods. You want to really do something that's clean at the beginning and there is of course only a finite number of clean things that we can do so I think we've exhausted all the clean bits now uh, it's already become, uh, become much harder um, but coupled to this notion in, there are many physics questions that you can ask within this and so I'll try to cover uh, as much as I, as I can within the two uh, afternoons that we had so first the, the way that, uh, that people started is, is to take really very simple magnetic systems and to say what if I have some kind of uh, coupling between uh, nearest neighbors, next to nearest neighbors and so on can I actually now talk about regimes where entanglement exists when I take infinitely many particles and then on top of it people started saying well what's interesting now is can I go into the critical domain can I actually look at the, the system behaving critically I'll talk about what it means to behave critically critical way. And then can I, can I actually show that something critical also happens to entanglement? So is entanglement like a standard order parameter? I'm abusing the language a little bit here because order parameter is meant to be a local operator. Um, entanglement sometimes is calculated as a global property of your, of your system. So it's not quite the same order parameter that a condensed matter physicist would use. Um, so you need to be careful with the language there. But basically the claim and I think that would be the coolest claim if we could make it. We cannot make it, unfortunately. No matter what we read in the archive, we still don't have good examples of that. The nice thing would be that, that all the conventional condensed matter methods fail to detect the phase transition, whereas entanglement suddenly becomes a good order parameter. If we had that, I think we'd make lots of condensed matter physicists excited about the topic because we're showing them a new tool that they didn't have before um, and what they had before was not good enough but I'll show you why it's not so easy to find something like, like that um, you can show that entanglement behaves funnily but you will then show that some other things usually also behave in a funny way in a phase transition so it's not a clear cut it's not as clear cut as, uh, as that um, and then what I want to talk about is, is, is the second part, so the first part is really the fundamental part. I can show you that entanglement exists under all sorts of conditions. Macroscopic bodies, uh, arbitrarily hot, massive, whatever else you like to have. But the second part of that is can I use this entanglement? And now you enter lots of physics questions because we, we, you know, what do you mean by can I use this entanglement? For what purposes? You know? the, 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 the name useful entanglement sounds deceptively simple, but actually we don't really know what it means to have useful entanglement. We don't even know whether entanglement is needed for quantum computation, so then I can't even define useful entanglement, entanglement appropriately. But the cool thing would be, can I take a natural system as my computer, and can I use that entanglement that's already there for me for free to somehow do computation? And, and for that you need to really understand what kind of entanglement so there are many issues like that. So the game started by simply analyzing, you know, all sorts of things like the Heisenberg model and the and the and the uh, XX model, as they call it. There are all sorts of names for these things. You have to be also careful about that. So various kind of exchange operators that that your systems can um, uh, can interact with. One one typical one I think we already saw it before is is an equal coupling between all the nearest neighbors and I'm going to use something like xx and yy um, i and i plus one and you can have some kind of external magnetic field if you like um, in the z direction and that's a typical xx model as people call it or some people call it xy model for obvious reasons and so on so basically um, the the reason why we use this model is, is because you can solve it exactly uh, but also there are one-dimensional systems that actually do conform to this kind of coupling so e even though there is no one-dimensional physical systems uh, this system basically physical systems are all three-dimensional 
you can have a complicated molecule where you really can identify a line of spins which are very close to one another but very far away from other spins in the, in the system. So they look effectively like a one-dimensional spin chain. So this does exist in nature as such. Um, and um, um, if, you, if you go into 2D, we already don't know how to solve this. I think you'll get a Nobel Prize if you solve a two-dimensional XY model immediately. Three-dimensional, you'll be famous. You can retire immediately. Anything in 3D you can solve, you can retire immediately. So that's how difficult it is. Okay. Um, so again, you have to be careful when people say, I take a realistic system, because realistic usually means something like that. Um, so now, why is, this, why is this easy to solve? It's easy to solve because you can really reduce it. Um, so what you'd really like to, to do is you'd like to be able to use some kind of Fourier transform to diagonalize your Hamiltonian, because that's the only technique we have to diagonalize anything. Okay? So I look at it in one basis, then I rotate the basis, and suddenly everything looks nice and clean, and nothing couples to anything else, which is what it means to have something diagonal. You can't do a Fourier transform of this, on these guys because to do a successful Fourier transform you need, you need a well-defined particle statistic. These guys are distinguishable particles. Um, you really have a spin at side i pointing in two directions and you have a spin at i plus one pointing in two different uh, directions. Um, so they are localized, if you like. Um, you have to convert them into either fermionic or bosonic particles. And actually, it turns out that you can nicely create fermionic particles out of them. And, and the jordan Wigner transformation is the one that, uh, that does that. So if you cannot diagonalize it with beta ansatz, which is what, what the uh, Heisenberg, uh, if you add ZZ coupling here, you will get the, the Heisenberg model. That's the famous beta ansatz. The other technique is, is jordan Wigner transformation. If you cannot use these two to diagonalize your model, then you cannot diagonalize your model. I mean, there is no analytic solution. These are the only two things that you really have to, to do things. So what, what jordan Wigner transformation does is really defines, uh, converts this x and y. If you like, this model is the same as, as sigma plus, sigma minus plus, sigma minus, sigma plus, up to a factor of 2. Um, so it really is an exchange interaction. It, it raises i spin and lowers i plus 1, and vice versa. And I said be, the, physics, the physics behind that is really that, that these are, these are uh, fermionic particles and they like to be anti-symmetrized uh, internally. And this anti-symmetrization comes from a Hamiltonian of this type. So now what you want is you want to create, you want these guys uh, you want this guy to become really the lowering operator uh, on i plus 1, and you want this guy to somehow become a uh, creation operator at the side i. So I'd like to write some kind of plus Hermitian conjugate. I'd like to upgrade these guys into something like that. Why? Because then I have a nearest neighbor coupling of fermions, and if I do a Fourier transform on, the, on these guys, if I go into the momentum, if I go into the momentum space, so if I define a, an operator bk, which is just a sum over i e to the minus, well, I should probably call it n, i n k a n, okay? There is a Fourier transform, if you like. Each operator in the position basis now gets assigned um, a momentum operator, if you like. If you shove these guys here, you will, in fact, um, get a Hamiltonian that looks, I'm being very, I mean, like I promised, this, this is going to be a research set of seminars. So I'm not going to go through every line of derivation, but you can open a random book on, on, on exactly solvable systems, and, and this will be written there. Basically, your Hamiltonian then looks like that, kk, it's diagonal. So there is an energy associated with the kth momentum, kth mode. And you can do that providing that these guys obey the usual anti-commutation or commutation relations. I mean, so probably you are more familiar with a coupled um, bosonic chain. This would be like a, a chain of coupled harmonic oscillators of bosonic fields, and you will get exactly the same logic diagonalized in the same way and so on. So basically, the jordan Wigner transformation is the one uh, that, uh, that converts <coughs> distinguishable particles into 
into indistinguishable particles. And the trick to do that is to define uh, annihilation operator at the I point as, as a product of sigma Z operators everywhere. So sigma Z1, sigma Z2, blah, blah, sigma Z uh, uh, I minus 1, and then sigma minus operator on, on, on the i spin. So the lowering fermionic operator is the same as the lowering spin operator times a sequence of phases. These are just going to be plus and minus depending on whether the spin here is up or down. And this is going to count the total phase of the guys in between. And if you now try to do, um, try to compute um, commutators between AI and AJ dagger, you will see that this is going to be the usual delta function. We should talk about anti-commutators, these are fermions. You will see that these guys are going to obey the usual anti-commutation uh, rules that are typical for fermionic particles because these guys, sigma z, are going to convert them into fermionic guys. So these are a little bit like extended particles. Um, the the i fermion extends over all sides from 1 to i. Okay, that's the Jordan Wigner transformation. So once you apply the Jordan Wigner to these guys, you will get a Hamiltonian of this type. And then you can simply apply a Fourier transform and you get a Hamiltonian of this type and you diagonalize it. And once you have the diagonal form, these energies, then you've got everything you ever wanted to have to be able to, to compute even entanglement. And that was a surprise to me. Okay? Uh, why was that a surprise to me? Because, okay, what, what you do traditionally now in, in, in statistical mechanics is you con construct the partition function. Okay? You say here is a guy from which everything else follows. Okay? So the statement in statistical mechanics is that once I give you the partition function, all the macroscopic properties of my physical system follow. So now the question is, does entanglement also, is that one of those macroscopic properties? So this guy here is basically everything you ever wanted to know, this beta is 1 over kT, about your system. Once you can give me z, you've got the free energy from that basically minus kT log z. And then you have what people call the royal road to thermodynamics, meaning now I start to differentiate this free energy with respect to volume, pressure, energy, whatever else you do, you will get all other thermodynamical quantities out of that. So I guess most of you know, I mean, that's called statistical mechanics. Now, one of the surprises was that actually you can calculate entanglement in the same way. Why is this surprising? Because it seems all I'm giving you here is energies of your system. This guy encodes energies of your system. But, but I'm not giving you the, eigen, the eigenstates of your system. How do I know if it's entangled or not? Okay? So what I'm telling you, for example, is I give you energy 1 of your system, I give you energy 2 of your system. I know all of these numbers, energy 3. But it looks as though the partition function itself doesn't contain any information about the states. It's the states I'm after. I want to know whether the states are separable or not, for example. So basically, it doesn't tell me whether this is like that. In which case, I would only have separable states when I mix them. Or maybe this guy is a state like that, and this guy is a state like that, and this guy is a state like that, and so on. In which case, I have some entanglement in my system. Okay? And the interesting thing is that actually the partition function does tell you about, um, about, about entanglement as well. And you can derive, derive witnesses of, of, uh, of entanglement in a similar way. Uh, and, and the reason is a little bit more subtle for that. So this is something I want to, I want to tell you about. Uh, but before I do that, I'll give you an example just, to, just, just for this whole thing to make, uh, to make a bit more sense. So basically, initially, people took various models, and then they computed things like, uh, what about the nearest neighbor entanglement? If I trace out all the sites, uh, and I look at site 1 and site 2, am I going to find some kind of entanglement? So for this, it's, it's, you see, the, the difficulty there is that you're writing a density matrix of these n particles. And the density matrix is a typical, um, typical um, Boltzmann mixture. Uh, so it's just the usual, you know, uh, 
exponentially distributed energies. So this H is your initial Hamiltonian. And in thermal equilibrium, your system will be in this state here. Okay. So, so another surprise is that I'm really going to be talking about equilibrium. Equilibrium should be the worst case scenario for entanglement because I'm not driving the system in any meaningful way. I just let it decohere with respect to the environment. So presumably I should be killing as much of coherence as I can possibly do. And yet it survives um, in, in, in this kind of environment as well. So now, what, what you can calculate is all sorts of properties, but what you really ultimately want is you want some kind of witness to tell you whether this is a separable state or not. So you'd like, to, you'd like to have one of those chases of the witness times your operator to be less than, let's say, zero, whereas it's always greater than zero for all separable states. And questions like that we can ask within this context. Um, and I think you, you will remember from, from the previous discussion that actually we already identified this guy on its own um, as a good witness of entanglement. If you, if you now talk only about two spins, just look at the i and i plus 1, then this quantity can never achieve any, any result greater than 1 for a separable state because it's like a product of Pauli, Pauli operators. So you can have at most 1 for the spin 1 and you can have at most 1 for the spin 2. Whereas what I claim is that if you have a singlet state, for example, this, is, uh, this, is, this has twice the value because it gives you one for this guy and it gives you, well, minus one for this guy and minus one for this guy. So in a sense, we already know that the Hamiltonian itself is a good, is a good, uh, is a good uh, witness of entanglement. So this W operator here, you can really substitute the Hamiltonian itself because for separable states, this Hamiltonian, well, I'm, I'm assuming B is equal to zero at the moment. For separable states, this Hamiltonian will be bounded uh, by j times n, okay, if you have n spins. Whereas for entangled states, it can achieve exactly twice j times n, because each of these terms can be twice as large. So, so it's a very simple observation that the trace of the Hamiltonian times rho separable is always going to be bounded by something like n times j. So I'm assuming that v is equal to 0 for the moment. Um, Whereas if you have if you have uh, if you have entanglement, then then you can always violate this. You can always go up to two n times j. So that's one simple witness. But of course now you, you can ask yourself under which for what temperature am I going to be within this regime? Okay, so it's always the same always the same game when it comes to very complex systems. We have to somehow go into into witnessing entanglement. But what's interesting is that even quantities like the energy itself become, become meaningful, meaningful witnesses of, uh, of entanglement. Um, so let me, let me, um, let me cut a, a little bit long story shorter here um, and just tell you a summary of this which, which you can start to recognize that in many other systems. Um, so, uh, so The awkward thing here is that I'm really using the energy. And, and that's not going to be very practical, okay, as, as you will see. So basically, if you translate this guy now, and you say, what happens at finite temperature now as a function of this beta, and what happens if I allow the B field not to be equal to zero, then you get a diagram which looks something like this. Um, so basically, one is uh, the B field divided everything is going to be normalized by j, by the interaction. So you can assume interaction equals to 1, if you, if you like. There are only two independent numbers, the temperature and the external field. And, and what happens typically for, for any kind of system, actually, this is just one example, I'll show you that this is a general rule, is that you get some kind of, some kind of a plot like that, remarkably close to 1, actually, this guy. Not quite one, it's two divided by pi. And actually I can probably even explain that if you if you give me a little bit more hours. So basically, what this says is that your system is entangled if the strength of your interaction exceeds the external field, 
And at the same time, the strength of interact, this should be KT, if you like, energies. All of these have energy units. Your, your external, your external field, uh, your, your temperature, external temperature, if you like, also is dominated by the coupling J. So in this region, you can show that that, that uh, condition there is always violated, and your state is always entangled. It's one of those weaknesses. So remarkably, really, it identifies very similar points to what, um, what condensed matter would identify as critical points of the system as well. So this, this KT being equal to J is also a traditional, a conventional, basically, phase trans transition in condensed matter, where you get magnetization below certain, below certain temperature. It's Curie temperature, if you like. Um, so, so what's interesting is that this kind of behavior people have started to recognize in many systems. So there's a certain universality which is even independent of whether the model is exactly like this or I have some extra terms or maybe I'm talking about bosonic particles and things like that. So, so it's interesting that first of all we can have a finite temperature. Secondly, I've really taken the limit n tends to infinity here. This is in the thermodynamical limit. I'm looking at, at a system that's very large. You can understand that if the temperature is too high in this direction, the spins will be very randomized and the state will become completely mixed. So here there is no entanglement. Also, if the magnetic field is very strong, all of the spins will tend to align to the magnetic field and you, can, you won't get any entanglement in that state either. So it's clear somehow that your temperature has to be sufficiently low and your external field has to be sufficiently low to allow for entanglement. Okay. And the usual rule of thumb is really B over J, KT over J, roughly 1. That's your critical, critical point. If you like to talk about the critical temperature, and critical B, B field. Okay? And you can derive it under all sorts of, uh, all sorts of different, uh, different conditions. So basically, this was a little bit surprising. Um, this was a little bit surprising to people, and then um, when I wrote my first paper, I was lucky that it went, it went to referees in nature, but I was unlucky that it was rejected. Uh, they said, oh, okay, look, I mean, you know, there's no physical evidence for this and so on. And then, and then what impressed me about that journal, which is why I highly recommend it to you, is that a year later, they said, look, you had a statement in your paper which said that maybe you could use magnetic susceptibility to detect this. And now we are sending you a paper where people have done that. So will you kindly enough referee that paper? So actually they do remember their, their past mistakes, if you call them like that. Uh, and, and there is a certain error correcting mechanism there. And actually that was the, the main punchline. So this was a paper by Grosch and other people, I think 2003, where they said, look, we are actually giving you real data. They took a grain of salt uh, something like a few milligrams of salt. They cooled it down to millikelvin, and they looked at the response of the of the magnetization when they changed the external magnetic field. So magnetic susceptibility uh, is defined uh, as as the the rate of change of the magnetization of your system with the external magnetic field. But if if you actually translate it into correlations. What this really ends up being equal to is a two-point correlation function. Sum over ij, sigma i, sigma j. And it looks remarkably like this part of the Hamiltonian. In fact, it is really this part of the, the Hamiltonian. So by measuring the response of your system, how does the magnet, how, do, how quickly do the spins align as I increase the magnetic field? What you're really measuring is the sum of the two-point correlations. How correlated are the spins inside your system? And that's actually the witness that allows you to talk about the, the system being entangled or not. And the plot becomes like this. Um, so it's really, now I'm turning it into real physics because me telling you that energy of the system is a good entanglement witness doesn't mean anything because no one ever measures energy. Energy is not something that you can measure. You can measure change in energy, but that's called heat capacity. Okay? That's a different quantity. In this case, you're measuring the change in magnetization, and that really looks like something that people do all the time, in fact, in solid state uh, physics. Let me 
enjoy a typical witness from that perspective. It's going to be the analog of what I drew there. It looks something like this. Temperature, susceptibility. Typically, you start from some low value of susceptibility in, in real world. Then you go up to some maximum value, and then you tend to go down with temperature. Again, the logic is, is very similar. That it, when the temperature is very large, your spins are so randomized that they are not correlated anymore. And since susceptibility is to do with correlations, you basically lose all of those correlations. Somewhere in, in between, there is a point, basically, where, where you get this maximum. And now you, you ask yourself, what about, what about, what about the, the witness of, of entanglement? Well, what that's going to tell you is, is, is the size of this quantity. How small can this quantity be? Okay, so for, for entangled state, this guy is going to be much smaller than for, for separable states. And if you, if you plot that on top, it looks something like that, okay? So it says anything below this guy. This looks like constant. Constant is whatever is the number, j, 2j, 3j, whatever you show is the bound for separable state, divided by kt. <coughs> And it says anything that's below this is bound to be entangled, because that's my weakness. And then you get a critical point here. That's the analog. That's the analog of this critical point here. That's the guy. And that guy says below this temperature, uh, you actually have points in your experiment which can only be explained with entangled states. And so the cute thing that I that I thought I, I I really thought it was a very nice thing to do is I went back to a paper which was older than Bell's inequalities, okay? Before entanglement even became an interesting game. I went to a paper in 1963 where they measured susceptibilities of a certain system. And I superposed on top of their they couldn't care less about entanglement, they didn't know what entanglement was in 1963, okay? So they were just measuring for fun susceptibilities as they do in, in solid state. And basically when you put on top of their uh, plots uh, uh, the witness of entanglement, you will see that there are lots of points in their experiments which are actually entangled according to this witness. So they were measuring entanglement uh, 45 years ago in some sense without even knowing that this is what they were doing. And it's very, inter uh, it's, it's very interesting actually. The point, the, the critical temperature in, 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 in those experiments was something like 5 Kelvin. And this is a ridiculously high temperature for a physicist, if you like, okay? because we can achieve nano Kelvin. So in some sense, um, if you translate um, separability issue to certain macroscopic quantity, heat capacity behaves in a very similar way, by the way. Uh, any second, any second order function, as it's known, any two point or higher correlation function, <coughs> you can actually translate this into a macroscopic. What does it mean, macroscopic? It means it's summed up over all of the spins, and that's what's interesting. I'm averaging over all possible spins, and I'm still not killing entanglement in this state. That I think is, is really surprising somehow. And you can then derive an entanglement witness out of that, and you can really show whether real systems are entangled or not. And, and actually, so there are, there are lots, of, lots of things to be said about it. Let me just see if I, if I want to maybe, uh, well, let me say one, one thing and then I will break and, and, and we can continue a little bit more. What was the second surprising thing um, in this kind of game um, was that actually you can sometimes uh, increase temperature and get entanglement from something that's not entangled. And this really sounds paradoxical. So I can have, I can have something uh, that at t equals zero, if you like, the density matrix at t equals zero is separable, but at some t greater than zero is entangled. And this really is counterintuitive. How can I heat it up? Shouldn't I be destroying quantum masses? I heat? That's what I told you, that you should have to be very careful about the classical limit. That, that, that it doesn't really exist ultimately in, in, in many ways. You can always find counterexamples. So how does this happen? The way that this happens is that you can imagine a system whose ground state is such that the spins are aligned with each other. But the first excited state is basically, uh, let's say, a spin singlet state. 
So at zero temperature, your system is 100% here. Uh, and it, it doesn't have any entanglement. But as you heat it up, the system starts to populate a little bit of the, of the excited state. And actually, when you mix these two states and you apply the Paris Kordetsky tran transposition or whatever else you like to apply, you will actually get an inseparable state for quite some range. Of course, at high temperatures, the system starts to populate all of the levels, and you will kill entanglement ultimately. But it looks very much like that susceptibility plot. It starts from zero, then it goes to some high value, and then it goes back down to zero. And that really is interesting that, that uh, temperature, and people later found that disorder plays a similar role. If you introduce noise, which is not due to temperature, but due to some other uh, fluctuations, you can also have a behavior like that. It, again, it, it goes back to the point that noise is not always detrimental. You can actually generate, you can generate coherence by, by, using, uh, by using noise. Um, now, why you have to be... So I think the whole, the whole witnessing of entanglement in many body systems can be summarized like this. No matter, no matter what your Hamiltonian is, one of the second order functions of this type will really be a good witness in general to detect, uh, to detect entanglement. So I'll say a, a lot more about it ultimately, but, but let me just make one uh, one statement uh, on which we will continue. Um, what is interesting here is that I, I talked about these electrons um, basically being spins with certain wave functions. And the reason why these guys anti symmetrize is because there is a significant overlap between the spatial locations. So your J, the J coupling, this J constant here is exactly equal to the overlap of the electronic spatial states. Okay? And you see, solid state physicists hardly ever think in terms of this, whether this is a useful entanglement or not. So I, you see, I've got, I've got a whole machinery proving to you that this state is inseparable. But now you come to me and you say, okay, show me how to teleport with this kind of entanglement. And now I'm a little bit stuck, because for me to teleport, I need Alice and I need Bob. And I need Alice to be different from Bob. And I need to be able to call Alice Alice and call Bob Bob. But the whole point is that these guys are indistinguishable. They're almost sitting on top of each other. That's why they are coupled in the first place. So can I, can I take them apart? And can I move one guy to one side of the universe and the other guy to the other side of the universe? And now you enter real physics issues. Is it really, can I convert this into the standard type of entanglement that people uh, talk about? So it's, it's, a genuinely, it's a genuinely hard issue. Something that's going to be even harder, and what we are going to do uh, when we, when we come, come back, is to look at the, at the bosonic uh, analog of that, where these guys basically will become bosonic operators. And what I'll be doing is I'll be making some kind of a bosonic gas just to show you how, how intricate the whole logic of witnessing entanglement somehow becomes. And I'll take some kind of bosonic gas of identical particles. So each of the wave functions, if you like, will be extremely spread out, like in a Bose condensate. They'll be all sitting on top of each other. And now I want to see whether I can somehow talk about entanglement within this, within this context. And, and the first thing you ask yourself, of course, is what's entangled to what now? I mean, now they are really completely indistinguishable. It's as if I have a huge uh, giant particle sitting there. And what can that be entangled uh, to? So there is a genuine issue of can I really ever talk about entanglement when I have identical uh, particles? And I want to somehow argue that you can, in both of these cases, you can talk about genuine entanglement. And it leads to all sorts of other interesting issues. One of the issues that I don't understand, but it's been observed experimentally, is the following. As I cool down the Bose gas, it's again the analog of magnetization there. As I cool down this guy, first the system will become entangled. So there's a critical point at which the system becomes entangled. Then you cool it down to half of this temperature, okay? Something like roughly divided by 2, and the system becomes a post-condensate. 
So the temperature where the particles somehow are in an entangled state is not the same as the Ketelet and MIT observed this. And he, he was surprised and he said, I don't know why this is the case. I also don't know why this is the case, by the way, but it's an interesting thing. So somehow the criticality where entanglement appears is not the same. It's very close. For a theoretical physicist, it is the same, more or less. But somehow you can detect the difference of a uh, factor of two. So the question is, why is this different? Why can't they use entanglement to quantify both condensation in this case? There are all sorts of issues of, of this type. So what I'm going to do is, let's make a break. Now a 10 minute break, and then we'll continue in this kind of time. Okay? So I, I'd like to just uh, talk a little bit about this issue. Like I said, I'm really picking and choosing topics. There's a zillion of things that we could talk about and certainly uh, spend more than, more than just two days on this. Uh, uh, so one issue is, 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 is this, can I legitimately talk about entanglement when I have identical uh, particles? Is that a problem? And, 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 and basically, if you, if you define entanglement properly, then you can talk about it even when you have identical particles. But the entanglement is now uh, between, between basically modes uh, and not between particles. So you have to, you have to enlarge your, um, you have to kind of get rid of some, pre some kind of prejudices about entanglement and you have to enlarge the set of possibilities. Basically, usually people have in mind two correlated electrons or whatever else you like to have, spins, which, which is what we call you know, EPR or bell type entanglement. Um, but, but actually, for entanglement, you, need, you really need only two things. One is that you need to be able to identify two different subsystems. And now I'm being very general. Subsystem doesn't mean a particle, it means a subsystem. Okay, so it means I can shine my laser here and I can shine my laser over there and these two don't overlap. It's as simple as that, if I can do that. And then within each of these subsystems, I need to be able to identify at least a qubit. But a qubit in a sense where I can access all of the degrees of freedom of that qubit. So basically, I need, I need two subsystems. I need each of them to have two different states, two distinguishable states. And I need to be able to superpose these states, not just to be in one or, one or the other, but I need to be able to create, uh, to go from zero into zero plus one. And if I can do this too, so if I can identify the subsystems and if I can identify qubits within subsystems, I'm done. I've got entanglement, no matter what. Okay? And now it's phrased very general. So if, if you talk about a closed gas, for example, and now you've got a bunch of, bunch of atoms, all of them are so cold, uh, that basically the wave functions are ridiculously big because you know that uh, lambda goes as one over square root of temperature and when temperature is almost zero this guy becomes huge. So now you can't say here is an atom Alice, here is an atom Bob. But what you can say is you can talk about a mode on the left hand side and a mode on the right hand side. So here is one subsystem. How do I know that? Because I can shine laser light that's as wide as half of this box, and I can only interact with this side of the thing. And then I can zoom in and, and, and couple, to, so I can certainly identify two, two subsystems. And now comes the interesting <coughs> question. So my entanglement is now between the left and the right, and what's gonna be correlated are the numbers of particles. So it's not that particles are entangled. What's entangled is the spatial domain here with the spatial domain here. And what I want to know, is whether my state looks something like this, which basically lots of people claim it does look like that. Okay, and so on. So, um, what this says is I've got zero particles on the left and on the right. One on the left, n minus one on the right. Two on the left, n minus two on the right, and so on. Here I've spread n particles everywhere in such a way that it's coherently superposed in this huge state. Some people would call this a closed condense. So is this an entangled state? Does this look entangled to you between left and right? And 
And a mathematician would say, of course it does. It's not the product of left and right. We know now that we cannot write this state as a wave function on the left um, times another wave function on the right. We just cannot do that. It's an inseparable state. It's mathematically inseparable. So, so far what I did is I showed you this left and right as two subsystems. And I wrote the state in a way that it looks entangled. But what I didn't do is I didn't show you whether I can access superpositions of these different states. Okay? So, so let's just concentrate on the simplest case when n is equal to 1. The state would be zero particles on the left and one on the right, and vice versa. According to the same logic, this is also an entangled state. Okay? But now I have, I have one particle entangled state. This makes lots of people nervous. <coughs> Again, if you come in with the prejudice that you need at least two particles to be entangled, then you're not going to like a single particle entanglement. But actually, what's entangled here is, again, the two regions. Your subsystems are left and right, and, and the correlations occur between the numbers of particles. If you have zero in one, you have one in the other, and vice versa. Now, this is not sufficient to qualify to, uh, for entanglement, because what I also need to be able to do is this, this guy. I need to be able to execute a Hadamard gate on one side. And this is something that lots of people are arguing about. Okay, there's a genuine issue there, and I, I don't want to spend 13 hours just talking about that because people go back and forth all the time. But the issue, I mean, you can see why this is very unusual. The issue is, can I, can I go from zero particles on one side to zero plus one particle on exactly that side as well. Okay? Can I coherently superpose no particle plus one particle? Okay? All sorts of arguments come in from decoherence, from super selection rules. There are X number of arguments why you should not be able to do this. And yet, in spite of all of these arguments, there are various people, including myself, that this is possible to do if you ground into the rules of the quantum mechanical thing. And so that's, that's where the thing lies. Let me just, let me just give you one, one heuristic argument why this, sh this should not last for a, for a huge amount of time. If you think about the energy of one particle versus energy of no particle, we are talking about mc squared difference. If you look at how quickly this rotates, you know, e to the i, omega t, I'm looking at this omega, which is the energy divided by h bar, okay? This is going to be super rapid. It's going to be so rapid that the claim is that the phase will be lost very quickly, like a dephase. You know, the guy is going to average out to zero because my measurements can't be as fast as, as this number here, okay? Because this is 10 to minus 34, this is uh, uh, 10 to 17, that already makes it something like 10 to 50, okay? So, okay, whatever is the mass here, 10 to minus 20, 10 to minus 30, doesn't matter. At best, this is going to be something like that, okay? So, in a way, what I want to say is that your, your, your coherence will last for at most 10 to minus 20 seconds. And you know that no one can measure faster than a femtosecond these days, 10 to minus 18 is probably the fastest we can do. So this guy makes 100 oscillations within one unit of my measurement. That's it. No phase. The phase is erased. Okay? But this is not a practical question. What if my measurement was on the scale of 10 to minus 35? Okay? What if I was measuring at the Planck's time scale one day? So will I be able to superpose? Here's the argument. Really, this is a genuine argument. It's a very important one. Because if you really show me that I can never fundamentally do this, then there is a limitation to quantum mechanics. Brilliant. That's really a brilliant result. It's not universal. There are things that cannot be superposed in this universe. I don't happen to believe this. I think you can superpose anything. Dead and alive cats, cats and dogs, you name it, you can superpose it. But this would say, no, sorry, the buck stops here. It's a very fundamental question. That's why people want to do this kind of experiments. Now, let me just show you this logic. 
on that kind of thing. So accept for the moment that this really is a genuine type of entanglement. What temperature would that, what temperatures are we talking about? And I want to show you something interesting. So basically what I want to do now is I want to talk about the expectation value of the Hamiltonian for separable states. And I want to show you that there is a bound that these guys cannot go below. So what am I going to assume are separable states? Now I'm going to divide this into many different regions. Okay? Let's say the size of this is something like small a. So I'm going to divide this into many different modes. And I'm going to ask, is this state at a given temperature? Is it a separable state with respect to these modes? Or is it actually an entangled state across these modes? And I want to ask about the temperature when this state becomes separable, or actually below which it becomes, uh, it becomes entangled. <clears throat> you can do a very simple argument, exactly like the one we had before. So what I'm doing now is I'm forcing each of these states to be described by a separate wave function. Here is a wave function for mode 1, for mode 2, for mode 3, and so on. And I'm going to do that kind of average with respect to that. <coughs> and actually, what happens now is that you are forcing each of these particles effectively to have a wavelength which is not larger than A. So if you can do this formally. You can really multiply it formally with these kind of states and show this. But the heuristic argument is, if I'm really forcing separable states, that really means I'm increasing energy. Because a shorter wavelength means a much larger energy of your, of your state. So basically, each of these particles, if you like, if you, you know, let, me, let me write the Hamiltonian down in general. The Hamiltonian is something like, um, momentum k, so h k, uh, this is p squared divided by 2m, kinetic energy, and then these are the number of operators um, for the kth mode. How many particles do I have with momentum k? And each of these particles has energy p squared over, over 2m. Uh, so that's your non-interacting both gas. And, and, and what, what I want to do now is I want to say, well, what if I force particles to really come in these brackets and I, and I force separability? When is that going to happen? Under which temperature is that going to occur? How hot does the system have to be for me to be able to do that? And what this means really is that I'm forcing each particle, I'm forcing this, this k here to be of a particular value, okay? Because k itself is 2 pi divided by lambda. But lambda, I'm saying now, cannot be larger than A. It has to be at best A, maybe even less than A. So if you see that the lowest amount of energy that this guy can have is something like N for N particles, and each of them has, has something like H 2 pi divided by A squared over 2N. Okay? And now I ask myself, what about, so this would, be, this would be saying separable states cannot go below n h squared over, let's ignore 2 pi, n a squared. Okay? And now you say, what about the real system? What's the expectation value of your Hamiltonian? You, you all know this. This is like a black body. I just have to integrate over all of this momentum to get the average value of the, of the Hamiltonian. And basically what you will get per particle, if you divide this at 1 over n here, okay? If you put that there, what you will get is some kind of behavior um, kt, okay? Some constant in kt, maybe to some power, depending on the dimensionality of your system. So what this will say is that, is that the, real, the real energy of the real system goes something like kt, and if that's below, the limit that I've derived, which is h bar squared uh, m over a squared, a is the spacing I'm forcing on these guys. How many modes will I have there? Then below that temperature, the system is always entangled. So here is a critical temperature. You see this h squared, h bar squared m over m a squared plays the role that j played for spin systems. It's exactly the same guy. Delivery, so you can map the two uh, into each other. And here's now an interesting thing. You say, 
Okay, can I have entanglement at an arbitrarily high temperature? Sure. Just, just make sure you squeeze your system more and more and more. If I'm dividing it into smaller and smaller spatial domains, if this A could be as small as I like, then this guy is going to be as large as you like. It's an interesting thing. Now I've got infinite temperature and time. Of course, providing that you believe that I can divide it more than the Planck's uh, length or whatever is the smallest we believe at the moment. But basically, by making my region smaller, I can amplify entanglement to whatever temperature. Note another thing, incidentally. H bar going to zero really does give you zero temperature. There is no entanglement, basically, in this system at any finite temperature. M tending to infinity also gives you the same classical correspondence that we had before, which is nice. T tending to infinity, K tending to infinity also has the same classical correspondence in this sense. So that's why I said, if you have a typical interaction between your system, systems, and here is the typical coupling between nearest neighbors of these atoms, <coughs> when you compare that to the, to the temperature, usually you get entanglement when the <coughs> strength of the coupling exceeds the temperature always the same. Strength of coupling exceeds the temperature. You will see this in all sorts of systems, continuous systems like force gases and so on. If you do this properly, like I said, you will get this factor of, of, of 2. Which is, so it's very similar result to both condensation, but not quite. And somehow there's this mysterious factor of 2 that's not clear. Why, why is the occurrence of entanglement not the same as the occurrence of, of force condensation? So you can do all so it's a very general, uh, general method. Now, um, what I want to show you, and I think that's going to uh, set the scene nicely uh, for, for tomorrow, is actually how does this link to phase transitions in general? And that's probably the last thing I'm, I'm going to say this afternoon. Um, so, th so the summary so far is, is take some observable. The Hamiltonian will do the job. It's usually the simplest one to deal with if you can diagonalize it. And just calculate how well can your separable states, what are the, what are the, the values of that observable that your separable states can achieve? And then anything that's outside of that domain you can prove is, is entangled. And this actually sounds like a very good, like a very good limit on, on entanglement. In fact, you can show that if you go to temperatures twice as high as this, you will get separable states. So this is another game, which is the mirror image of this, which, which would be called witnessing separability. So I have, a, I have a temperature below which I'm entangled, but can I have a temperature above which I'm definitely separate? And you can do that. And the gap is very small. You get a factor of, of two between these guys. So this witness is, is not, uh, not that at all. So if you phrase your question about entanglement in terms of subsystems and in terms of two independent degrees of freedom within each of these subsystems, then you can talk in a very unified way about any kind of um, particle. Distinguishable, indistinguishable, fermion, and uh, fermionic and bosonic. Now, what's also interesting about entanglement is that there is a very weak dependence on dimensionality there. If you look at one dimensional system, you will get a bound like that. If you look at two dimensional system, there is a factor of two. Three dimensional is a factor of three or something like that. Basically, you always get entanglement independent of dimensionality. But when you talk about phase transitions, this is no longer the case. And this is actually an interesting, an interesting point. So th this is why, see, this is why we we are hoping that maybe there are some phase transitions in 1 and 2D, which conventional uh, condensed matter is not able to explain, because I will prove to you that there are no phase transitions in 1 and 2D. But somehow entanglement, because it exists in 1 and 2D, it can show that there is a phase transition. And that's why people go usually for low dimensions, lower than 3, because that's the obvious one. So phase transition. Um, and I want to show you how detecting phase transitions is very similar to witnessing entanglement in some sense. So entanglement is a, is a kind of real world parameter within this picture. Um, this is known under many different names, but I think the nicest proof was really given by, by Piles a long time ago, and I really encourage you to read. I think he's got a um, he's got a really nice book on uh, surprises in theoretical physics, part, good of parts, okay? He was very creative. 
and he had lots of good arguments where people would spend pages and pages on calculating this guy would actually be able to derive it from some very intuitive arguments um, much faster. And here's the logic. He was looking at, at uh, short range interactions, uh, let's say of a one dimensional spin chain. But you can, you can use the same logic for continuous uh, Bose, Bose condensates or anything else uh, to rule them out in, in 1 and 2D. So basically, his logic was like this. In order for me to reach, to have an equilibrium phase that's ordered. So what does it mean ordered in a, in a spin magnetic system? Something like that. In order for me to have all the spins pointing, let's say, up, at some finite temperature, below 5 Kelvin, all of them are pointing up. That's what it means to have an ordered phase. Um, what I have to have is I have to have the free, so a definition of equilibrium is that the free energy, which is the difference between internal energy and, and uh, temperature times entropy, this guy has to be equal to zero. So the free energy, the ability to do work, is actually minimal in equilibrium. It can't do anything useful. That's what it is. There isn't any free energy in equilibrium. And now what Paul says is he says, let, let me actually let me let me let me compare the change in, in this guy to the change in entropy. And I will show you that these two can never match each other in one and two D. So there is no hope that I will ever have a phase transition. In, in, in one dimension and uh, in two dimensions. In fact, in two dimensions you can't have in this system, but if you go into continuous ones, you cannot. So Pulse's logic goes like this. If I flip one of these spins, say you're starting to increase the temperature from zero, you increase it by an epsilon. And now there is a certain energy that allows one of these spins to flip. What is the change in, in energy? Well, the change in, if you think that each of these spins is coupled to its nearest neighbors by J, it could be actually next to nearest as well, as long as, as, long as it's, it's somehow finite. <coughs> in this case, the change in energy will be simply 2J, okay? One on this side and one on this side. But the change in entropy due to this would simply be uh, log N because I could have flipped any of these N spins. So if you look at the change in entropy, it's always log times of the number of possible configurations. And the number of possible flips that I could have is simply n. And now Pyle says du is independent of n. This guy scales is log n. There is no way that in the thermodynamical limit these guys are ever going to be equal. This guy cannot equal that guy. Therefore I cannot have a equilibrium at finite temperature. It's brilliant. It kills phase transitions in 1D. I see, okay, spent a whole PhD, five years, proving that 1D I see model doesn't have a critical point. And after that he was super disappointed because he thought he could explain phase transitions. But then to, to his actually um, astonishment he discovered that there are none in 1D I see model. If he knew piles, and if he spent a little bit of time thinking in this creative way, he wouldn't have wasted his PhD. He left physics up, but he was seriously impressed. <laughs> it's a very bad result. Quoted all the time now, but it's a bad one. But here's the summary. That's why you don't have it. And now you say, okay, what about 2D? Can I have a critical temperature in 2D? And now I'm going to derive the Nobel Prize winning result of Onsaga in two seconds. I mean, that's what's powerful about this. I'm going to get it within 50% of the Nobel Prize winning value. So it's half the Nobel Prize, okay? More or less. That's how powerful this is. So now I've got a two-dimensional array. <coughs> Why can I have a phase transition in 2D in a discrete system? So basically here is what uh, what Piles does, you know. So imagine again all of these guys pointing in some direction, whatever they are. And this is the ordered phase. And now you want to ask yourself, does this persist as I start to increase the temperature, okay? And now the calculation is, is very different to the previous calculation because what you are asking yourself is, is it possible to have two different domains of spins? One domain where they're all pointing up and another domain where they're all pointing down. 
And if you calculate, again, we are calculating the change in internal energy versus the change in, um, in entropy of these guys. So the contour that's the, that's the best one for you in order to match, to match this guy is, that, is a contour that really wiggles around as much as possible. So basically what this contour does is really goes around all of these spins and it flips, it flips every spin on the inside of the contour and makes them anti-parallel to all the spins outside of the contour. So basically you do a zigzag as much as you possibly can do in a contour like that. And if you look at the change in the internal energy, what you, you are really doing is you're cutting something like n times j units. So each of these is coupled again by j to nearest neighbors. And if I really go through all of these guys and I make sure I wiggle as much as I can, then I'm cutting something like n energy units. How much entropy is this doing? Well, from every point, I could proceed in three different, I'm, I'm coming from this direction. I could either go this way, this way, or forward with the contour. I have, I have three different possibilities for every spin. So this looks like t times log 3 to the power of n. This is the number of possible contours. At every point, I can go in any direction other than the, the direction I'm coming from. Everything is allowed. So that's how many contours I have. Now look at the scaling of both of these terms. Both scale as n. So if I equate them and I say, where is the critical point? The critical point is when nj is equal to t times n log 3. Okay? And n and n go away, and you're getting a critical temperature which is equal to j divided by log 3. Okay? I think it's not log 3, it's log root 2 in the Nobel Prize meaning. Well, but it took the guy 10 years. It's a 2 of the 4. It's an unbelievably complicated paper to diagonalize 2 in. I see change. The logic is always the same. Internal energy tends to order your system. Entropy is what introduces disorder. And the question is, can they ever meet each other? And the point at which they meet each other is the critical point. Anything below, order prevails. Anything above, disorder prevails. It's as simple as that. And it's a universal error of the Now, what about entanglement? And here is an interesting way of thinking about that. Um, so again, when it comes to entanglement, it's much harder to talk about these things because, um, because we can never tell with certainty the region. We can never <coughs> separate the region of separable states from entangled states exactly. We can witness entanglement, but we can't really do it with certainty, and I think that's where, the, that's where the difficulty arises. So the usual logic goes like this. Imagine I start with some ground state which has a certain amount of entanglement. Okay? That, in a way, is...